Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And look, I prefer not to stand behind the lectern if that's okay, uh, because I don't write any notes down, so there's not much point in me doing that. But uh, firstly, can I just say uh, to Seka here, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a real privilege to be here in, in an organisation that clearly has uh, strong ties to the Southeast Asian uh, region, and, and certainly this is an area for New Zealand uh, that we are particularly keen to form deeper relationships with. So uh, we are excited to be here. This is my first time in the Philippines. Uh, so even though I've been traveling for a number of years, do you need the microphone? Yes, you need, is that better with the microphone? Yes. That's okay, right? Look, now, certainly I've been uh, traveling for a number of years, but my first time in the Philippines, and uh, I've just been on to some farms, some dairy farms, uh, and so I haven't had time to put uh, my suit on, but uh, I'm a farmer, so that's what I do mostly. And so uh, I hope you understand that uh, if I don't have to put on a suit, then I'm very happy. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Can I just um, also say that uh, you were playing uh, the video earlier of New Zealand. Have, have any of you been to New Zealand? No? No one's been there? Not yet? Maybe one day? Maybe one day. <laughs> I always put the, uh, the video up there as, as a wee way to just show a little bit of New Zealand because uh, we have uh, a lot of people from the Philippines uh, are visiting and living in our country uh, and it is certainly a privilege to have them there. They're uh, doing some very good work uh, for many of, many of our businesses in New Zealand uh, and they tell me that they're going to learn a lot about farming and then bring that back here to the Philippines. So. Uh, uh, if uh, any of you have the chance to, to come down to New Zealand, please do. Uh, we, we like it there. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about New Zealand first before I talk about the agricultural story. Uh, because sometimes uh, New Zealand is not well understood by many people around the world. So firstly, uh, we don't have many people in New Zealand. 4.4 million people. Uh, so it's a little bit less than uh, your 100 million people in the Philippines. Uh, we're a country about the size of Italy or the United Kingdom. So again, we're not a very big country. Uh, and our GDP uh, is about 169 million, uh, a billion US dollars. Now the thing about New Zealand that's quite unique is that we are two main islands. And so we do have a lot of coastline. And you see, you'll see there uh, that there's no place in New Zealand that is more than 130 kilometers from the sea. So we are quite a coastal country, uh, but we also have uh, a number of mountains, and you will have seen some of the scenery. Uh, that picture on the top right there is a picture of the Canterbury Plains in the South Island, uh, which has uh, a lot of flat country before it rises very steeply up into some uh, uh, mountains where there's lots of skiing and, and other activities. Uh, the other thing about New Zealand, which is quite unique, and certainly from an agricultural point of view, is the fact that uh, we're a grass-fed farming system. So we don't have concentrates in New Zealand, we don't grow a lot of grain in New Zealand, and so our animals live on grass, and they live outside year-round. So some of that is changing a little, but 99% um, of what we do is, is free-range, grass-fed uh, farming systems in New Zealand. I just want to now just uh, come back up to what I think are really the exciting issues at the moment. And certainly I keep saying, as I travel around various parts of the world, that actually food is the new fashion. Uh, there is so much excitement about food and food production. Uh, some real concerns about food security. Uh, and that can mean uh, different things to different people. Uh, but it is absolutely the number one talking point when I go and talk with various uh, countries, it doesn't matter whether they are in the developed world or the developing world, uh, food is the thing that everyone wants to talk about. And some of the things that we're picking up as being crucially important are things like food now must be safe. Food safety, and you know in this part of the world how important it is to have safe food, uh, it must be safe. The supply chain has to, be, has to have integrity. We must make sure that we can demonstrate uh, to any consumer that, that requires it, uh, that we have got integrity in the supply chain. And very often now, as consumers, we're, we're relying on the retailers to make sure they do that for us. Uh, but as a producer, we need to make sure that we are well ahead of anything that might be asked of us 
by the consumers. We're seeing clearly at the moment the premiums will be paid for quality. Stories add value, and, and you saw some of the imagery in the video earlier about New Zealand, and that's something that we're trying to do much more of. Uh, you can't just rely on a reputation. You need to tell a good story, I think, about where it's come from. And of course, for many people now, a lot of the story is about being local. So a number of countries in the world, the real trend is about buying local produce and helping with the social uh, aspects of the community. Food for health is, is becoming increasingly important. And so now we're seeing in New Zealand a, a lot of inquiry about the relative benefits of grass-fed uh, beef, lamb, and milk, uh, and certainly some of the omega-3, the increased omega-3s that can come as a result of a grass-fed production system. So uh, we think there's still a lot of work to do in this area, but certainly from New Zealand's point of view, uh, this is a real opportunity around food for health. And we're also seeing in, in this big food and fashion area is, is the use of co-products and talk of these co-products uh, in the use of nutraceuticals. So we now have quite a big business in New Zealand uh, around uh, blood, animal blood products, uh, and, and, and using those in, 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 nutri sorry, in nutraceutical areas. So and it's, it's becoming a really important uh, part of what we're doing. A lot more of the value for our exports is coming from what we now call uh, the fifth quarter. So you have the four quarters on an animal, uh, but the fifth quarter, which is the co-products, uh, bloods. You know, we've even got companies in New Zealand uh, that are now manufacturing heart valves uh, out, of, out of sheep uh, tissues. So, you know, this is now starting to become not just food, uh, but actually about the products around food that can add so much value. I'm just going to take you through, through three slides that I often use to illustrate uh, just what's happening around the world at the moment. There's a series, a time series here, you may have seen these before, uh, but this is the population of the world in 1987, when there were 5 million people, and each of those white dots is a population centre of a million people, of 1 million people. So when I flip through them and you go 1987 at 5 billion, 1999 at 6 billion, and then 2030 at 8 billion. And it is phenomenal. And I'm going to go back to the beginning and, and point out, because now you've seen the series, just to point out where we think the real opportunities are. And you'll see quite clearly the really densening of population around your region, around this uh, Asian, uh, particularly Southeast Asian region. The other thing that worries me slightly, and I don't think the world's really paid enough attention to this, is what's happening in Africa. And so I think there are big opportunities in Africa, but I think the world, uh, particularly those of us who can produce food, have a responsibility to talk about how we can uh, pay more attention to Africa and to meet Africa's needs. Because in many cases, uh, the African farming system simply won't be able to cope with the population growth that's going to happen in that part of the world. So you know, if you look at, again, the time series, 1987, 1999, and 2030, so it's an extraordinary story. I have to point out, this forecast was done for New Zealand, so this is a little bit New Zealand down the bottom of the world here. Uh, and they picked that uh, Auckland and Christchurch would be population centres of a million people, but the Christchurch earthquake has probably put pay to that. Um, and so we've had a real setback in the South Island of New Zealand with uh, the earthquake that hit there, and, and a number of people uh, were killed in the earthquake. It was very sad, but but it's going to take a long time for Christchurch to recover uh, following, following the rebuild that's still happening. It's likely to last for at least 10 years. So I want to talk now about the New Zealand reform story in agriculture because it's something that uh, has really uh, set our agricultural sector alight. So I'm a farmer and so I was uh, in New Zealand in farming at the time that the reforms hit. Uh, and, and, and at the time, in 1985, uh, the New Zealand economy, New Zealand was basically bankrupt as a nation. We had no money, we had uh, inflation that was rampant, uh, we had uh, a bit high unemployment, uh, and the government's accounts were, were seriously uh, in trouble. And we had a government on the day that said, look, the only way that we can do this is to slash spending, uh, and they did it overnight. So we had a budget uh, where, where our Minister of Finance at the time 
uh, announced that there would be no more support or subsidies paid to farmers. Uh, this is a country that relies on farming for its income and its future, and they literally stopped the subsidies overnight. It was an incredible time in New Zealand to be farming. It was an incredible time, a uh, difficult time for many, uh, and I'll talk about that maybe a bit more. Uh, but certainly what happened uh, is that we saw a huge challenge, huge upheaval. A number of farmers did have to leave their farms uh, because they simply did not have the ability to, to cope under, under an environment that was unsubsidised or unsupported. Uh, but we are now the least subsidised agricultural nation in the world. In fact, um, I would say we have no subsidies, but uh, I'll, in, the, in a couple of slides later I'll explain where we do have some support that counts under the producer support index uh, that we measure this on. But the important point here is the bottom point, is that the reforms in New Zealand of the agricultural sector set the scene for an unprecedented drive for efficiency and innovation. So we knew that the government was not going to pay our wages anymore. The only way we could survive, the only way we could prosper was to actually become more efficient, more innovative, and that's exactly what we've done. It also changed the way we used our land because all of a sudden we had to make choices about uh, what the best use for that land was. Because if you weren't getting paid or supported by the government, then every piece of farming had to make sense. And so now actually we have uh, another, not much of our land that has been retired and put into national forests. And so we have about a third of New Zealand that is retired in the natural forests. We also have other non-forested land that, that regenerates. And we have just over half of our land in New Zealand now that is pasture and arable land. And within that, we've also had to really think hard about whether the best land use is for dairy farming, or for sheep and beef farming, or for growing grapes and making wine, uh, or for horticulture. And those choices are now just made on economic grounds alone. So our primary industries are still very important to New Zealand. Uh, we are um, <coughs> still very reliant on, on agriculture. Uh, we have, I won't go through all the numbers, but about 29 million sheep, about 6.5 million dairy cattle, um, and, and, and we also have deer, a lot of grapes. Our arable sector, as I said earlier, is not a big sector for New Zealand. We don't have the land area or, or the scope to produce a lot of grain. And of course that then means that we don't have a lot of pork or poultry either. So our, our domestic pork and our domestic poultry businesses are almost non-existent. We have some small players, but the large uh, amount of, of pork that New Zealand consumes is actually imported from, off, from overseas. We realise we're not competitive in pig farming because we can't grow cheap grain, and so we literally have to look at doing other things and relying on imports to satisfy that demand. So with New Zealand, we actually feed, uh, we have a population of 4.4 million people, um, but we, we actually produce enough food to feed about 40 million people, uh, depending on how you do the numbers. So, you know, for us, of course, um, if uh, we don't have access to markets, then we are in big trouble, because I, I eat a fair bit, but I can't eat enough for uh, 40 million people. So we feed about five to eight times our population. Uh, but one thing that it's often a myth that uh, people think about New Zealand is that we could swamp the world with produce, you know, and, and particularly uh, flood markets with cheap uh, produce out of New Zealand. But that's simply not the case. We produce enough food for about 40 million people, uh, and our resources now are pretty much fully allocated, uh, fully utilised. We're now looking at how we can really increase value rather than volume, because our, our volume, our production levels are now at a stage where, uh, where we need to think about other ways of, of creating wealth. So most of our products are exported, as I say, 4.4 million people. 90% roughly of all of everything we produce is exported. Uh, dairy, 90%. Beef we consume a bit more in New Zealand at 83% exported. Uh, but for us, of course, that is a major challenge. A uh, major opportunity, but a major challenge. Because remember, most of the food uh, that is produced in the world is consumed in the same country it's produced in. So that's, again, again, it's something that people take for granted. But for us in New Zealand, who only consumes about 10% of the food we produce, markets and market access are very important. 
So for us, um, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the Doha Round, still remains our number one priority. I know that we all smile when we say that because it's been going for so long and it's really bogged down uh, in real difficulty in Geneva. Uh, but for us, this remains uh, really the only forum where we can see uh, market access, subsidies, and also have disputes resolution mechanisms uh, really convened and undertaken in one body. The free trade agreements that are now underway, and certainly we've been uh, spending a lot of time on free trade agreements, bilateral agreements, uh, regional free trade agreements, and of course one of the best examples of that globally at the moment is, is the ANSFIT agreement, uh, the ASEAN Australia and New Zealand free trade agreement. It's probably the cleanest uh, and certainly the most ambitious trade agreement that's out there. Um, but, but we've certainly been progressing those in the absence of reform uh, through Geneva at the WTO. Uh, because for us as a non-subsidised producer uh, or producing nation, for us um, barriers to markets are actually really just barriers to progress and innovation. And so we would argue strongly that when you have a protected domestic industry, the incentives to actually innovate and become more efficient simply aren't there. And it's easy to talk and, and say that, of course, it's better if we're more efficient, uh, but the reality is, uh, until you're faced with the reality of, of having to compete uh, with products from other countries, then, then that is a very hard step to take. And the cost of market access, really, and when we look at tariffs and barriers to markets, they're really, they're really costs and tariffs or costs on, on, on producers and consumers. Because people sometimes don't really understand a tariff and what it means and what it does. And a tariff is just a tax uh, that the importer has to pay to the customs department before they can uplift their product out of the customs store and take it into the market and sell it to consumers. So I use very simple examples sometimes uh, just to, and if I look at 40% tariffs on beef into Korea. So that just adds 40% to the cost of that product before it can be sold to the consumer. Uh, the only people that miss out there are the consumers in the market and the producers who could have received some more along the way. So, as I keep saying, market access and barriers to, uh, to markets uh, are certainly eroding value for farmers and consumers. And so there's, now, there's a real need to continue to work on eliminating these. And of course, the real thing that's now uh, coming up has been really important for us as we start to get free trade agreements across the line is these behind the border issues, these technical barriers to trade, the non-tariff barriers, the, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures that are put in place uh, that are actually there to prevent products getting into markets. So it's one thing doing the free trade agreement, uh, we really need to make sure we follow up and, and deal with the behind the border issues also. Well, this hasn't come out properly, this map, so market access progress for New Zealand it actually is meant to have the rest of the world in white. Uh, but certainly we've got a number that are in place, uh, and if I look at um, around uh, various parts of the world, in fact this doesn't really show up well enough, but we've got a number of agreements in place, we've got a number of negotiations, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which is a 12-member, 12-country uh, 12 uh, negotiation that we've got underway with Japan and the USA. <clears throat> and also the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which involves this part of the world as well. So I won't cover them too much. So our export footprint is diverse. I talked earlier about the fact we export to about 90% of what we produce. So we send products to every market in the world, about 200 markets all around the world. Uh, we have probably been uh, guilty of sending too many of those products as raw commodities. And we're now working hard to really increase the value of those. Uh, so that we can capture more back in New Zealand for our farmers. If you look at the markets, and, and look, this is out of date unfortunately, but I'm waiting for the 2015 bar because it goes in five year uh, blocks. If I look at the share of New Zealand food and export uh, value by region, going back to 1965, and you'll see that uh, in 1965, of course, we were very reliant on Europe as a market. Uh, and you can see what's happened as time has gone on. Clearly our exports have shifted much more to Asia. And I'm expecting, uh, of course I know it's significantly higher than the numbers show there, uh, but East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, of course that's now becoming a crucially important market. 
uh, for us, not just with the growth of China, which is getting a lot of attention right around the world, uh, but in particularly this SEA group of countries as well. I talked about the subsidies earlier, um, and I just thought I'd just put this graph up to illustrate uh, we did have low subsidies for a while, and then in the 70s and 80s was when our government decided at the time that agriculture needed support. Uh, and of course, in 1985, they came off overnight. There was still a legacy issue of some subsidies that were still being paid out as they ran down over time. Uh, and now we are, as I say, the lowest uh, in, the, in the OECD uh, number of countries in the world. This just demonstrates uh, the productivity gains that happen following the removal of subsidies. And again, I apologise for the old data here. I've been trying to pull some more recent slides, but while subsidies were on, we had growth in the agricultural sector of 1.5% per annum. Uh, since, it, since we had subsidies removed, we got to 2.5% per annum up to 2004. Interestingly, if I take from 1990 through till today, uh, productivity gains in the agricultural sector in New Zealand have now grown at 4%. They've increased extraordinarily over the past 10 years uh, and, and been growing at 4% per annum. And that uh, compares with the rest of the New Zealand economy, which has been growing at about 1% per annum. So we're seeing a real drive for, an effic for efficiency now that's really trying to take our agricultural sector to a new level. This just illustrates some of the examples, and if I look at uh, landing percentages on our farms, that have lifted uh, significantly, about uh, 20%. Uh, average land weights have lifted 28%, uh, which has meant the, the number of lands sold uh, per kilogram of ewe carry uh, is up significantly, about 70%. Milk solids per cow have lifted significantly as well. So, so we are continuing to drive for efficiency, um, and the productivity improvements for us are a way of our farmers uh, earning more uh, and really ensuring that they uh, have viable businesses into the future. I'll skip over this one because I'm keen to get into the, um, into the discussion and I'm hoping you're asking lots of questions. Um, the really important point about New Zealand, and it's one that we've been talking about here over the last few days, is that farming in New Zealand now is absolutely about a business. So we used to talk about farmers and businessmen uh, what we now really talk about uh, farmers as businessmen because for many of our farmers now we have uh, farms that are worth significant amounts of money, uh, not just the land value, the livestock value, uh, turning over, uh, and the average farm in New Zealand today would turn over something like 5 million New Zealand dollars. I'll let Toph do the numbers to work out um, what that works out into in pesos. 165 million pesos, pesos? yeah. So, you know, these are significant businesses, and of course the decision-making now uh, is critically important. So, our decisions are dictated by the markets, not the government. Uh, uh, sales uh, are made depending on customers' expectations. Uh, production has to be efficient, profitable, and sustainable. And of course that's really the drive at home at the moment is around the sustainability drive. Farms are certainly getting bigger. We are getting fewer farmers, and that's just a natural progression. Of, of farmers looking to scale up and become more efficient. Uh, but importantly, the family farm at home in New Zealand still remains uh, overwhelmingly the model for farming in New Zealand. We have a number of corporate farms, uh, but there are only relatively few. And the family farm, or the larger family farm, is actually still the dominant uh, theme of farming in New Zealand today. Where we have a little bit of support for uh, our sector from the government is in some research programs. So uh, we will see in, in the producer support index around subsidies, uh, some support for New Zealand farmers. It is in the form of matching funding for some research programs. I have three of them here. We have what's called a sustainable farming fund, uh, which is around uh, projects that will help the environmental and social benefits. And I noticed that some of the programs that are underway here uh, have certainly taken on board you know, inclusive and social uh, outcomes, which I really applaud. The Primary Growth Partnership, we've got the government in New Zealand that has really decided to uh, try and encourage the private sector to really take uh, innovation to a new level. And so they don't lead with the money, 
Uh, but if groups come together or companies come together with good ideas, then they can get some matching funding from the government uh, to help them in those innovation programs. And we've also got the third one here, which I notice is a thing that's very similar uh, to the Philippines, is the Irrigation Acceleration Fund. So climate change uh, is, is significant. Uh, it's impacting our, on our agricultural sector quite heavily. Uh, where I live is a very dry area. It's very good for growing grapes, and I like drinking wine, so that's good, but uh, it's not so good for me as, as a sheep and meat farm. And so we've got uh, an Irrigation Acceleration Fund, which uh, again is some matching funding uh, that can come alongside farmer money uh, to look at irrigation projects in New Zealand. So, but challenges remain. Uh, the overall, overarching challenge uh, for New Zealand is, is to protect our reputation as a trusted supplier of quality, safe food. Uh, and I've just got a few themes here. I, I really mean the safe food with integrity. So it's no good anymore just to say uh, our food is safe, trust us, believe us. We have to have programs behind uh, our brand, behind our name, uh, to prove and demonstrate uh, that food safety is absolutely at the forefront of everything we do. Biosecurity for us, if you travel to New Zealand, you will note that uh, when you go through the, uh, the, uh, the import uh, process in New Zealand, the, the customs process in New Zealand, we are very, very tough on biosecurity. So if you're bringing in any fruits or any vegetables, uh, they simply won't be allowed. They'll be put in the bin, uh, we check bags, uh, I will have my shoes because I've been on farms, my shoes will be checked by uh, biosecurity officers before I come into New Zealand to make sure there's no dirt on them. Uh, they will be washed if there's any sense of any, any sign of any dirt. We are absolutely focused on trying to protect our biosecurity status in New Zealand. If we had foot and mouth disease hit New Zealand, uh, our economy would just come to a halt. Uh, in fact, uh, we would slip into recession according to the forecast within about 12 months. Uh, we're so reliant on agriculture, biosecurity for us is our number one risk. Animal welfare, of course, is another big one. Uh, we're getting increasing scrutiny from uh, Big, big buyers of New Zealand's products, particularly the supermarkets who are now acting as the gatekeeper for consumers about our animal welfare standards. So again, we have to make sure that we are best in class at this as well. And environment, of course, is a really big one. Uh, water, waste, uh, dealing with climate change. Uh, this is as much an issue for customers offshore um, as it is our urban consumers within New Zealand as well. So we now have a lot of pressure in New Zealand, uh, particularly from the city people, about how farmers are treating the land, about what might happen with nutrient management into waterways, uh, and this of course is now, well this is probably the biggest issue facing farmers in New Zealand at the moment. So there's a few challenges, but behind that we, uh, we keep saying there's a world of opportunity out there, and, and I keep coming back to this Asian region, it's why we spend a lot of time here, it's why uh, I'm traveling a bit to this part of the world. Uh, there are more people living inside that circle than outside of it. Um, and it is the fast, exciting part of the world, the growing markets. Uh, not necessarily just growing population, but in our view, the really important part is, is actually the growing wealth that's really uh, the thing that will, will enable people to buy more and more of our high quality products. So ladies and gentlemen, in my conclusion, uh, look, the opportunities for agriculture in a hungry world, in my view, are immense. I'm incredibly excited about it. Uh, I've never been more excited about the future of agriculture, the future of food. Uh, the agricultural reforms in New Zealand that we put in place back in 1985 have certainly worked for us. Uh, we would not be uh, arrogant and come to other countries and say that uh, they should do what we did, uh, but certainly by telling our story, it's interesting how others are looking to see uh, how they might be able to replicate some of the things that have happened in New Zealand. Improved market access is an enabler to greater wealth for farmers, and when we talk around the world at the moment, uh, many farmers are talking about not being able to make enough money, not being able to remain in the business of farming, and barriers to markets are simply barriers to farmers having a sustainable and viable business. And look, we're certainly looking to work with the Philippines uh, to improve production and demand for food. We have a number of projects up here, particularly in the dairy industry and uh, the farms we're on today. We've got uh, 12 demonstration farms 
uh, that, that the New Zealand uh, industry is working together with Philippine farmers trying to look at how we can implement some New Zealand systems but with a Philippines flavour. Uh, because we know that you can't come here and just do what we do in New Zealand. Uh, but, but we think that by trying to help with some of the management techniques uh, that we've employed in New Zealand, uh, that we can help uh, the dairy industry here in particular uh, be more successful in what is an incredible market here, incredible opportunity and demand for dairy products in particular. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll finish there. Uh, I'd love to have questions and, and comments and challenge and debate, uh, so please um, uh, feel free. We'd, we'd love the conversation. Sure, there must be one question. Who's going to be first? <laughs> Hello, I'm Henry, a program specialist for research and development here at Sirica. My question is Christchurch, I know, is very active in fish and regional organic standards, right? Christ, Christchurch uh, is experimented in the development of the Asian regional organic standards, which the Philippines is part of. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm Generally curious, uh, does it have something to do with AEC? Uh, you mentioned Australia and New Zealand, ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand, FDAs, and then SPS and TBs, it's all part of it. Uh, it's sanitary, five sanitary standards, not tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade. Uh, is it a way to penetrate the AEC next year? That's why New Zealand is, is promoting for the development of the Asian Regional Organic Standards. Because I know that we cannot, we cannot keep up with the development of Thailand, especially New Zealand, even, even I think Vietnam, in harmonizing the standards. But uh, how, how do you suggest we do it? How do we, how do we keep up the Philippines? Yes. Are you talking about organic standards? Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think we're promoting organic standards uh, significantly. In fact, our organic production in New Zealand has dropped off quite uh, significantly over the last, in fact, since 2007. Uh, so I'm not sure that we're promoting. Tom, do you know anything about that? No, I don't think we're promoting the standards necessarily. One thing about New Zealand uh, is that uh, because we are largely a free range grass fed farming system, we're, we're very close to organic anyway. Uh, but, but I certainly haven't seen any any agenda around uh, strengthening or promoting the standards uh, around organics. Uh, in fact, uh, we, actually, we have a number of organic farmers in New Zealand that uh, are quite uh, are very concerned that they're not getting paid enough for their organic products at the moment. And one of our, one, a number of our companies are saying that there simply is not the demand for organic products worldwide at the moment. Uh, and we're, we're actually probably moving a bit more the other way uh, rather than into organics. I'm not sure what that answers your question, yeah. but yeah. Uh, follow up. Uh, one of the major, uh, maybe you, you mentioned about the removal of agricultural subsidies in yes. New Zealand, but in the Philippines we are heavily subsidizing agriculture. Uh, the Philippine government sees it as a way to develop agriculture, but New Zealand was able to maybe one percent growth in agriculture sector in 20 years without subsidies. But, but uh, how, why is it that the Philippines is giving so much subsidy, are we on the right track? Based on your analysis. Yes, yeah. And, and, and I'm always very careful not to come into countries uh, and to, uh, to talk about their domestic policy. Because for us in, in New Zealand, uh, if, if uh, taxpayers are happy to pay taxes and then for that money to, to come from the government to their farmers, then that is for them, that's, that's a business for their, uh, them to talk about and, and, and discuss. Now, the problem for us always comes is if those subsidies are used to, to produce food that is sold on world markets at cheaper prices. And if that happens, so we call those trade distorting subsidies or trade distorting support, then, then for that's when it becomes an issue for New Zealand. Uh, but look, all I'd say is that I understand how difficult it is here in the Philippines. Uh, you've got about 50% of your population living in the rural areas. I understand about a third of your workforce is, is in agriculture. 
Um, so it's, it's very, very sensitive, it's very political, and of course it's fundamental to probably uh, you know, the wealth of, of the Philippine communities. So it is, it is challenging. I mean, what I would say is that um, if I was uh, in the Philippines, I would want that, that money to be directed uh, the best way possible to make sure that it was encouraging farmers to be more efficient uh, and hopefully to get to the point where one day uh, they may not need subsidies to have a successful business. And so I look at it and say if you have subsidies then I think that they, are, uh, they, they stop people from trying to be efficient if, even though it's just, the driver is just not there, it's not so, not, not so strong to have to go out and say I need to be more efficient and more profitable without government support. Uh, but if you can get people moving in the right direction by incentivising them to actually uh, become more efficient, then that would be a better use of the money. There must be some challenges, I'm sure. You must think that some of that in there wasn't right or can't be right at all. We have a lot of... A lot of um, it's going to be interesting, interesting to see how many of our uh, the workers in New Zealand from the Philippines come back here into agriculture. That, I think that's another opportunity, I really do, for, uh, for agricultural development here. There, there are a number of uh, Filipinos in, in, in agriculture in New Zealand now that, you know, if we saw them come back and think about uh, farming here, uh, using what they've acquired, the knowledge they've learned in New Zealand, you know, I think that's a real opportunity. I think we have about 40,000 people uh, from the Philippines now living in New Zealand. And, and most of them are in either agriculture or horticulture. Well, in the Christchurch earthquake rebuild too, so there's a few there as well. <coughs> no more? seems being hard work, uh, long hours, and certainly if you're in dairy farming, <clears throat> of course, you know, very long hours. Uh, but we are spending a lot of time, we're taking uh, school leaders, uh, school groups out onto farms uh, and talk to them about farming as a career. Uh, and, the, and the other aspect for us that's really important is the thing that's probably made, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's made New Zealand very successful has been the professional and the service and the support industries around agriculture. So whether it's in banking or advisory and consultancy work or animal health expertise, uh, nutrition knowledge, uh, farm management advice, uh, these have been very, very important sectors. And so we see a number of uh, young people, even if they are not going farming, they're looking at how to get involved back around the agricultural sector. I guess also with um, where we've been able to cope with less people coming into agriculture has been uh, the innovation and technology we've put in around farming. So if I look at my farm in New Zealand, I finish about between 700 and 1,000 cattle a year, and I finish about 5,000 lambs a year. Uh, well, I do that uh, really part-time on my own. Uh, but we've got automated waste systems, uh, automated drafting systems, uh, animal health programs that are, that are very uh, uh, easy to run. They don't uh, require much work. So a lot of our technology on farms has really changed the way we farm. Whereas that farm in the past would have had three people working on it. Good afternoon. In the earlier parts of your presentation, you mentioned about um, uh, how computing, competing land use um, in New Zealand just revolved up, uh, uh, around the um, agriculture sector, um, just like um, planting or for, um, 
for grain production one or for for um, livestock. However, in the Philippines, um, the competing um, land land use alternatives are different. Um, agriculture um, competes with um, um, residential because of the increase in population um, and also industries. So given that um, there are that the setting in the Philippines is different from um, Australia. Do you think it is still worthwhile to push? New Zealand. Yeah. New Zealand. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sir. It's a, it's a common mistake. <laughs> uh, in New Zealand, I, do you think it's still um, worthwhile for the Philippines to push through through the agriculture agriculture sector, just like in New Zealand, given that the um, the land use um, alternatives are different. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I think it is, um, but, but it's much easier to do that when you are reliant on, on what you earn off that piece of land uh, as your only income. So uh, if I look at New Zealand, we had, uh, in, in the period where we were getting subsidies, we had sheep and beef farming on land that grows some of now the best uh, red wines in the world. And so it didn't make sense. But, but of course, because the government was paying farmers uh, on a per, for every sheep they had, uh, then, then that's what happened to the use of that land over time. So, so the important thing for me is that we now have some councils in New Zealand, uh, regional councils that are saying, uh, where are we going to have uh, urbanisation and, and urban sprawl? We want to make sure that we zone the land and make sure they build houses on the least productive land. And that makes sense to me because we have a limited amount of land and, and a limited amount of resource. So uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's easy, but, um, but they are they're hard conversations. But, uh, but I think it's important to make sure we continue to make the best use of each bit of land we have. Uh, because if you look at the figures globally, the amount of land available for agriculture continues to shrink in a world that is continuing to grow in population. So we need to think about this much more, I think, you know, all of us around the world as, as we move forward. So you certainly think um, zoning would be um, the first step in um, reorganizing the, the priorities for land use in the Philippines? Well, I, don't, I don't think necessarily in the Philippines, it might not be the case here. Um, and maybe the politics would, would not allow that. Um, so, you know, I'm not suggesting that that's uh, necessarily a recipe for the Philippines, but in New Zealand, that is what is happening. And it's also happening in a number of other countries around the world. So, you know, I, th I think all I'd say is, uh, for us, it's, it, it's something we need to do. Nothing, um, I will ask that. In New Zealand, is there any or are there any incentives for the people to go into agriculture without even the government to subsidize it? Because here in the Philippines, the government subsidizes for agriculture and people are encouraged to go to, to, to it. Mm. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> no there, are, there are no incentives. Uh, in effect, <laughs> the cost of going to university now to do an agricultural degree is actually very high. So, um, look, I don't think we've got this right. Uh, we haven't got this, we're not doing this 100% uh, right either in New Zealand, but um, uh, we don't have incentives. So we have, I guess you could call them incentives, maybe some scholarships that are offered by uh, commercial companies, uh, by corporates, corporations, uh, scholarships that might pay for some of the students' uh, education. Uh, but there's literally only there's only a few of those around, maybe ten, six or eight or ten, you know, in, in New Zealand. So, no, we don't do we don't do that uh, so good either. Are you looking for a scholarship to come down there and study? <laughs> Other clarifications? Okay, so if there's none, can we give another round of applause for the students?